Welcome, everyone. Um, we'll begin in a moment. I'm just waiting for a couple of people to join us. Um, my name is Louisa Oliette, and um, I'm curator of talks and events at the Photographer's Gallery, and I'm based in London. It'd be great to get a sense of where everyone's from in the chat function if you want to let us know where you're zooming in from. But uh, we will make a start in a moment. Just going to let some other people in briefly. Great. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. As I mentioned, uh, my name is Louisa Uliet and I'm curator of talks and events at the Photographer's Gallery. And I'm delighted to be here with today's speakers, artists Hoda Afshar and Brett Rogers, director of the Photographer's Gallery. Joining us from Melbourne today, Hoda works across moving image and moving and still image to explore the possibilities of documentary image making to consider representations of gender, marginality and displacement. Today, she will talk us through works like Agonist and Remain, which were inspired by her previous Manus Island project, as well as her recent publication with Mac entitled Speak the Wind. I will share information on the book in the chat function here, which will also include details of how it can be purchased. With Hoda today is TPG director Brett Rogers, who many of you will be familiar with. Today, together, they will go through individual images and talk through Hoda's practice and research. In terms of format, we will start with a 20 minute presentation by Hoda before moving to the in conversation with the two of them. And there'll be time at the end for questions and contributions from you. The event should last roughly one hour in total. Please note we are recording this. However, you will not be featured and will only appear at the end if you decide to pose your questions directly to Hoda. We are approaching this event with the aim of creating a form of trust and mutual respect. So please keep that in mind. And lastly, uh, before we start, I would like to thank you all again for joining us. We hope to see you at some of our other forthcoming online activities, and even more hopefully at the gallery where we are currently showing a retrospective of American photographer Helen Levitt and a new commission by British artist Helen Kamek. Anyway, thank you all again, and now to Hoda Afshar. Hello everyone, um, thanks for being here. Thanks to Brett for inviting me um, to speak uh, with you all today. Uh, I'm gonna start sharing my screen hopefully can get this sorry just bear with me um okay um first of all i'd like to um um, um, um acknowledge that i'm zooming here from the Wurundjeri country of the Kunin nation in Melbourne, Australia. And I'd like to start by um, uh, acknowledging that I live and practice on a stolen land and offering sincerity and solidarity, my respect and support to First Nations people of this country. My name is Hoda Afshar and I'm an Iranian born artist living and working in Melbourne, Australia. And um, I uh, am going to share with you uh, some of my past and most recent works today. I have to race through it as quick as I can um, to be able to fit in um, all these different projects um, uh, in, in the short time that we have. Uh, so I'll probably jump from one project to another, but Brett asked me to share with you a couple of my earlier works uh, at the beginning of my practice and then um, kind of to show how some of the strategies and methodologies I started using intuitively at the beginning of my practice, I'm still developing and ex um, expanding today in my work. I was trained as a documentary photographer in Iran. I, I did my bachelor degree um, at Azad University there. And uh, my practice was basically centered around uh, social documentary. And I was really passionate about issues related to, you know, so social hierarchies. And also um, like when I discovered photography as something that could actually um, give me, um, a rebellious tool to document the hidden spaces of, you know, like for example, my youth and the underground parties in Tehran, like because I was born after the Islamic revolution in Iran at the beginning of the war between Iran and Iraq. And at the time that the country was going through the transition from monarchy to an Islamic Republic. And so the, the, the Islamic government of Iran had a very certain and limited way of imaging Iran. And there was, and still there's only certain kinds of images that can be shared publicly or taken. So 
camera is often considered as a dangerous tool. So like having a camera in your hand was for me from the beginning as a rebellious act. And also our public private spaces are very different. What happens inside is not allowed to be shared outside. So I was really excited to know that I can use photography to document my life. And I knew from the beginning that I could not share any of those images or exhibit them, but I, there was this urge to document that. And uh, from the beginning, I was also really conscious of the fact that when you take the camera inside um, those spaces, nothing is real anymore. People are very conscious of the presence of the camera. And my friends knew what I'm doing. So everyone was staging scenes of like, they were like, how about I do this and you take the photo? How about I roll a joint? How about I do this and that? So the, 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 from the beginning, there was a really great level of intervention in the process of image making. And, uh, but because my training was this objective kind of approach to documentary and documentary meant that you do not bring your personal emotions or interruptions or interventions. You, it's just, it has to be truth. And like, um, so it was more like the idea of click and run. So at the time that I was making these images, it felt like that I'm cheating, but deep down I felt like this is closer to our truth and reality because people were involved actively in the process of making those images. They were also, you know, choosing how to represent themselves to the camera. Another project is the cloth, um, uh, the cloth ceiling. Uh, my dad was a lawyer and he was working predominantly with clients that were within that juridical system, very powerless, mostly women. And also he was taking lots of cases that people couldn't really fight. And um, I was very curious about his cases and he was all, always sharing those stories with me. And so we were always talking about, you know, the hierarchies that exist within the Iranian society and the class division. And I was very conscious of that. And photography from the beginning became a tool for me to kind of explore those boundaries and the lines that divides people. And um, the, the, I, I got to know this family of um, basically women who were living in outskirts of Tehran. And um, the mother was um, a drug addict and the daughters had to sell their bodies to be able to provide the family with food. And they were living on the rooftop of a um, building with the, uh, in a room that they built, but they couldn't finish the ceiling, so they had to cover it with cloth. So I spent a year with this family. We, uh, this is like at a stage where I learned um, how to build up trust. It was like basically places that they were taking me to, the houses of their clients and so on. There, there was a lot of risk involved, but it only was uh, possible to do based on, you know, the trust and collaboration that we developed together. There were protecting me and like it was and also trusting me with the project and again like there was a lot of you know intervention in the process or re-staging and reenacting involved I never shared those images publicly or like exhibited them publicly I mean but for me it was like the beginning of understanding that relationship between you know the camera the hierarchies and you know the authority that it gives to the storyteller and trying to remove those boundaries between the photographer, camera and the subject and get them involved in the process. I'm gonna jump um, 12 years ahead from there. I migrated to Australia in 2007 and my practice completely changed from that moment because I couldn't make documentary work anymore. I had no knowledge of you know, the historical political um, um, issues of Australia or that emotional connection. So I kind of experimented a lot with different modes of image making, but also at that point, it was like my experience of migration and the struggle with identity, especially, you know, being a non-Western migrant coming from an Islamic country into the West is always a very shattering experience. So being confronted by issues related to, you know, representation, misunderstanding around your identity or this image of me that existed in the mind of the West that I had to constantly fight against. So from there, my interest became more and more in the nature of images and the role that they play in the construction of these assumptions about different identities. And a lot of my research, I did a PhD on this topic, and a lot of my research became about understanding, you know, the 
um, structures or formulas that construct minorities and, um, you know, uh, um, uh, and like it struggles from like gender struggles to, um, you know, race and issues uh, to do with the refugees that to me was the ultimate marginal. It was, um, what I can say in general is that like there's a single concern that unites my entire work and it's probably that of representation or visibility. And by that, I mean like the both um, political and, and it's both political and aesthetic dimensions. One of the writers that really helped me to understand uh, the relationship between images, I mean, aesthetic and politics uh, was Jacques, Jacques Rancière and his uh, writings on, you know, the, the, um, the, the aesthetic of politics and the pol politics of aesthetic and the distribution of the sensible. He believes that, you know, politics is basically um, uh, the struggle for recognition and visibility and what we understand of the world and the norm is what's defined to us through the images and what's been excluded previously is what's you know uh, defined as the other and so he kind of argues that there's this uh, aesthetic to politics and that's what I was I'm trying to do with my photography now that um, I'm trying to um, create a more balanced distribution of the sensible and bring more images into the visual realm, images that's been previously excluded or stories that have been made invisible. They need to be brought into the visual realm as like to occupy the space as much as pos possible to a point that it's considered as the norm. Like if the white skin is considered as the norm is because we've seen it more. And if we bring more of that into the visual scene, we will, at some point um, accepted as equal. Um, the work that I'm going to talk to you about is Remain, the work that I made with the asylum seekers that were detained by the Australian government in offshore detention centers on Manus and Nauru. Um, Manus was in Papua New Guinea. From 2013, Australia decided to send all the um, um, refugees that were arriving in Australia by boat to offshore detention centers in remote um, islands that there was no access to to the to those places they wouldn't let anybody in it was just really controlled the way that they were imaging it and um, at that point I was thinking a lot about you know um, themes that I was reading in Hannah Arendt and um, Georgia Agamben on the notion of bare life the life that is stripped of you know basic human rights and also the state of exception that our states were um, or the, you know, juridical law can be um, completely dismissed uh, for, you know, uh, under the name of, you know, uh, protecting the borders and they can actually send people there and um, they are excluded from the uh, rights of the citizens, but they are subject to the law of the country. Places like Guantanamo Bay or like uh, Abu Ghraib prison, they're all models of that and Australia picked up the same model for the refugees here. Um, I collaborated with one of the refugees that was um, basically trapped on the island with the rest, Behrouz Bouchani. It was on Manus Island, Australia sent more than 1400 single men who were arriving there without families. Uh, and they basically caged them for four years in the tropical heat together, 1400 men. And Behrouz was one of them too, he's an Iranian, Kurdish refugee who was like um, a very successful writer. He had to flee the uh, country from the fear of, you know, persecution because he was an activist for the Kurdish people's rights. And um, so he started writing extensively and secretly on his mobile phone from the Manus Island to let people know what's happening there. Australia's successful strategy was to kind of keep them hidden from the scene and like no one knew who they are and they portrayed them as dangerous criminals that needed to be you know kept in there and at that point my question was why the society is not responding to this barbaric situation this is the most inhumane treatment of you know refugees and um how could australia close their eyes to it and i got in contact with behrouz we talked a lot about this and behrouz was so excited that an artist wants to work with him and we we shared a lot of similar ideas we both came from a documentary background and 
in his writing, he was challenging the images of the typical images of the refugees, their stereotype, and he was trying to break that image because we both believe that the reason why the world's not responding is because of the way that the refugees are portrayed as, you know, a group of identical group of victims that all they seek is, you know, um, safety and so on. So him and I, talked for six months on we exchanged lots of voice uh, messages on whatsapp and planned this whole trip I had to secretly pretend as a tourist to go to Papua New Guinea and get a visa on arrival and then secretly fly to Manus and he him and I organized for where I was staying who was helping me all the locals and we were getting six refugees out of the camp secretly every day get on a boat go to another island that was close there um, and make work together. Like we built a studio in the island, as you can see in the images, um, with a piece of cloth, um, black cloth. We, and on the left, you see the refugees, the Kurdish boys that were helping me, the team of directors there. The idea that I asked them was to bring, you know, to make the, uh, every single one of them a separate story and a separate image that was bringing their individualities and identities forward because they were called by numbers they were denied you know identity and um, so I asked them to pick a natural element from the environment that we're, we were in that was I explained to them what metaphor means and how we can actually use something that can express or show their stories. And for example, this is a footage of the backstage. When we were making it, RF picked water because for him water was representing his journey um, on the boat, but also he was um, talking about how he often um, has this dream of, you know, going back to the childhood when his mom used to uh, wash him in the bath. And for example, the image on the left that you see after like repeating that scene over and over again ended up being Arf's image. Or um, Ahmad was a stateless Kurdish Iraqi man and he picked sand as like representative of the soil. He said, soil represents the land to me. Land is the most precious um, uh, idea in, in Kurdish culture, but we're torn from it and they're torn from, um, I'm torn from it and the land is torn from us. So it was like basing each person's story uh, and representing it through a different element was to bring their personalities and individualities forward. I made a two channel video installation also there. That was when I arrived there, the beauty of that island, it was the most lush tropical island I've ever seen. But then hearing the stories of the men about what they witnessed there after like five, six years, the loss of you know friends to suicide, medical negligence and murder by the guards. So many refugees died there and they shared those horrific stories with me and the juxtaposition of the beauty of the island and the, the horrors of these stories was the most disturbing experience I've ever had. So I wanted to bring that into the work to portray the island as the prison because in the film you hear them also calling the island the green hell, like a place that uh, made them hate the color green. So I wanted to bring that you know psychological aspect of their torture and trauma into the work. The work is dedicated to the 12 men who died on Manus Island, the refugees, and um, all the symbols that we picked from the island is to represent the idea of death and their fear of dying there. Um, quickly going through the other work agonistes um, that I made um, a couple of years after returning from Manus Island. And Agonistes at the beginning was a response to the experiences I witnessed on Manus because the refugees there told me that any Australian employees who complained about the atrocious conditions of the camps, they were immediately dismissed and sent back to Australia, threatened with two years jail time. They lost their jobs and they were never allowed to work with a governmental organization again. And when I heard that, I found it at first really difficult to believe that that's such a thing that can happen in a you know um, democratic system. But then I wanted to investigate it more and I did and I realized that it's not just in, in the immigration um, area, but all the different governmental organizations. And I found a lot of different whistleblowers who spoke about at some point they were 
caught between, you know, the, the struggle with morality and the public and uh, they couldn't bear the thought and they had to risk everything and they went to the media or just spoke out about what they witnessed and that meant that they lost their jobs dealt with like lots of legal matters and threatened with jail time. I made two different, again, like I saw this project as a mirror um, image or response to um, Remain. And um, I wanted it to also have a similar aesthetic, but also a very kind of different struggle because here it was, um, you know, like people, the so-called like, white Australians who were actually fighting for the rights of uh, the, um, you know, the refugees or the people who were subject to that um, level of, you know, suppression, but they were treated almost in the same way. And um, there the, the are people in the project who worked like as the lawyer of the Afghanistan, um, the um, army in Afghanistan, working with the defense force or the intelligence service or like people from disability sector, the indigenous um, um, prison camps or refugee prison camps and so on. So I tried to bring all these different narratives, which was very heavy and difficult to gather, but together to show that there's something really wrong within the system, like to show the fragile state of the democracy that we have now. And the title Agonist is, basically um, is a um, um, Greek word that me means like a person that is enduring and in a struggle and relates to terms like agon, protagonist, agony and so on. As I said, they, they come from all different areas and um, in the work I wanted to reference two things, tragedy and democracy, because Tragic theater helped to establish democracy by showing the civil disobedience and dissent. And also the main character always in tragedy is the character that is caught between the conflict and conflicting choices of responsibility, obligation, morality, and the law, and so on. The reality of the Athenian democracy was a system rooted in patriarchy, slavery, warmongering and xenophobia, which today is not that different. And the crucial function of tragedy was to give voice to the excluded and voiceless. But the difference between the two projects that I worked on, the one on Manus Island with the refugees was that I wanted to bring the character forward, but the nature of tragedy is that the action is uh, the most um, important purpose of the tragedy and the character is secondary to that. Here, I didn't want to portray the whistleblowers as the heroes, but I wanted to bring their actions forward and also to show that the aspect of the struggle, which was at first like for them to speak out was the only way it was to remain anonymous. So the idea of removing layers of identity, the struggle that we have in the West is now with too much visibility, the idea of surveillance and control and how we, we try now to hide from that kind of extreme level of you know exposure and visibility. So I, I used um, a 3D scanning um, studio with 110 cameras. That was a scanning uh, all different sides of the faces of the uh, whistleblowers, but then um, the only thing that this technology couldn't record was the details of the eye, which to me is like what reveals the identity. This is a test I did on myself that like bring you bring all the 110 images into this 3D space and it just stitches it together. It's a very shabby version, but then um, like we created like, um, I wanted them to look like the Greek statues of the Hellenistic period. So we modeled them into that because uh, the Hellenistic period was the first time uh, in uh, that the artists were turning towards, you know, ordinary people before that it was always like, you know, the statement and powerful people. But the Hellenistic statues were like also uh, aiming for the imperfections in the subject and the emotion of the subject and so on. So I wanted to mimic that. And we created each portrait um, like uh, resembling in a statue or a Greek bust. And this is the first uh, 3D print that was like coming out of the printer when you see the legs, uh, you know, like there's something really powerful about this idea of an image as, a, as an object and the complex relationship that it has with its subject. It was like feeling like you're holding the, the spirit of, you know, the image in your hands. I was really inspired by, by the history of the practice of the sculptor Medardo Rosso. 
and how he used photography to document different expressions of his sculptures. And so I was taking the sculptures into the studio, experimenting with different modes of lighting. And I wanted to, like the idea of getting an expression from a lifeless object was a really interesting one too, by moving the light one millimeter here and there, like the expression was changing. But I wanted to, you know, like, um, uh, push forward that dramatic kind of aesthetic of, you know, uh, tragic theater and so on. This was the first installation of the work in the public space that it was commissioned for by Photo 2021 Festival. And um, like, it was really interesting to see how people were gathering around these uh, billboards and having, you know, conversations about what was what they were reading because there were texts at the bottom of each that explained the struggle of each individual. I removed their names, as, as I said, because I wanted to bring the action forward, not their, um, not their um, characters. Um, this is the installation of the work in the gallery space um, at Ramsey Price in South Australia. The second element of the work was a video again that I have to probably uh, quickly um, mention something about it, that I was trying to um, basically mimic um, the aesthetic of documentaries that try to hide the um, uh, identity. Like again, that, that, that the experimentation I do with the documentary genre, but I want to bring kind of uh, limitations of it into into the work as well like the really the video that I made is like made of very harsh jump cuts that um, from one skin to another one face to another to capture you know the intent the intensity of the emotions that these people are carrying within themselves and also thinking about you know always we when we make work about the subjects that people who are subject to you know uh, injustice. It's always historically with photography, we use the body of um, the person, the victim that is subject to violence. But this idea of looking at the body of the people who witness that and the body that preserves other people's traumas and um, like uh, archives it like, you know, museums, the body as a museum. So I wanted to kind of uh, stitch all these different narratives together to talk about the body uh, of these people as one body, the body of the society, basically in pain. Lastly and briefly, Speak the Wind is what we are going to talk about tonight with Brett, is a book that I made uh, last year in London with Mac Publishing. It's a book that is um, um, basically about um, its relationship to other projects that I talked about is its relationship to visibility. Again, another form of exploring photography's relationship to, to the invisible and unseen. Um, this is the first page and the last page of the book. The book is made of um, two different like um, layers of time. Uh, the images are in color and changes into black and white. It's about the history of a spirit possession in the islands of um, uh, southern Iran, in the Persian Gulf region, the Strait of Hormuz. And um, when I first traveled there, I was really fascinated by the beauty of the landscape and its strangeness and also different layers of history that I was, um, you know, hearing like oral histories that people share. It's, it's a place that is like no other place. Later on, I was absolutely obsessed with the place. I kept returning since 2015. I returned so many times. And the more I learned about the place, the more fascinated I became. And it's about, and then soon I learned that the spirit possession culture and narrative that exists is, is, uh, is a history that was brought to the region through um, the slave trade um, that was happening from the 13th century, um, the, the African slave trade in the Persian Gulf region. And um, it was brought by the Africans to the area. The slavery only ended in 1927, but a big population of Africans still live in the islands, but they're subject to severe racism still to this day. And, uh, but the, uh, when people are possessed by the wind, the only people who can negotiate the exit with the wind or peace with it are the people of African descent. So they're, you know, uh, the dynamic changes. Um, I, the, the work has multiple, you know, um, aspects. One is like um, the relationship between humans and landscapes and how identities 
are defined by the place and landscape and something that um, you know, most Western cultures has eradicated from, you know, the local cultures that they occupied. But in these places, you see it very raw. Well. And also another exploration of photography's problematic relationship to these uh, questions of, you know, race, hidden histories and ethnography. So I was exploring the ethnographic documentary language, but exploring its other possibilities. I'll end it here so Brett and I can start having a conversation from there. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Huda, and for that wonderful talk. I mean, I learned so much more about your work. Um, I think we met several years ago when you were in London and you showed me the beginning of the film, Remain, and I was so impressed with it, even when I saw it then. But I watched it again in, in preparation for today, today's talk. And I really can't, recommend it highly enough that you go onto Huda's web website and watch the entire film because um, not only is it remarkable in the terms in which she has talked about it, about being witness to these tragic ridiculous stories of um, inju human injustice uh, against the beauty of this landscape and the birds chirping, etc. And you think how on earth did she manage to make that within those confined conditions? But there's such an amazing uh, connection between poetry and reality. Um, the, the way in which the, the subjects talk about their, um, their ordeals, how they approach uh, the whole subject of, of the film has stayed with me forever. And um, I suppose in, in that really, Huda Berush plays a, a central po point because you did refer in your opening remarks to the fact that he was a journalist, a writer, he's a poet really. And uh, he, he's he, some just just collecting some of the incredible uh, parts of his text that he says in Remain. He says he see, he sees himself as a sponge with a soul, awaiting for kindness to arrive. He, he talks of crocodiles waiting to swoop down and kill the birds. Freedom is a heavy gift, like something unfamiliar, a mess of ruinous pleasures. And um, it's it's this the combination of the poetry of his words and the words of the other subjects combined with the, 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 the terrible subject that, we, that was the, uh, is the subject of the whole, whole work. And I just wanted to thank you really, um, as, as all of you who are listening to the, this talk today know, I am Australian born, um, but um, I have lived in Britain for the last 41 years. And you have taught me so much about my own country where I was born and opened my eyes. You have lifted the lid on the in, incredible injustices that, is, that are going on there. I mean, in the, in the UK media, I think everybody here would agree with me that Australia is, is um, portrayed as a place of a, a multicultural success story as a society, a land of milk and honey, um, you know, one of, apparently one of the best, um, the best promotions for Australia is still the fact that the Neighbours soap opera is one of the most popular television um, um, soaps in, in the UK, painting a picture of Australia, which is completely distorted. Um, and um, I think that, you know, what you're, what you're doing by revealing, lifting the lid on these stories is revelatory for everybody, for Australians and for people abroad. Um, I am a bit concerned that obviously that your work hasn't been seen a lot here. Um, I just wanted to remind people that your um, whistleblowers has only just recently been shown in the Royal Photographic Society in Bath as part of Erin Schumann's curated show. Is, is that exhibition still on, Huda? It was ended it? on the last weekend, I guess. Oh, last like weekend. Oh. But I think many of us have seen it. We're very impressed. And also that you were showing in um, an exhibition in San, near San Sebastian that was curated by John Uriati in Spain. Is that right? Oh, yes, yes, that's correct. It was uh, there um, quite recently as well. The same project. Yes. So, right. but no, nothing else being being planned for for, for Europe or this side of the of the ocean. Of the country? Um, I've got um, potentially showing Speak the Wind in Vienna. Um, um, Verena's here, I can see the name. And yeah. um, um, next year, and hopefully, potentially um, um, in Italy, which I'm not 100% sure yet, but it's um, in conversation. Yeah. That's good. But just so all of you do know, apparently next year is going to be a UK Australia festival all over, over the UK over all art forms, but many visual arts organizations will be 
uh, presenting for the first time um, major solar shows by Australian artists. So this is a great opportunity for us all to update our knowledge about what's going on there and see who, who this practice within a wider context. Um, but before we start on the book, um, I wanted to say, ask you, I hope it's not a provocative question, but to say that many artists who work with the themes that you do with injustice, in a representation and visibility, these days prefer to call themselves activists rather than photographers. So um, I've never heard you talk about that. And I, I, I do notice you always are very committed to being labeled a photographer and an artist who uses other lens-based medium. But how do you feel about your work being understood as activism? Um, I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but I am an artist. And, you know, like sometimes um, I want, uh, uh, like for me, the success of Remain and the changes that it contributed to kind of strengthen my belief in art and its power and the power of beauty. Um, I think for everybody that there, there's a way to, um, for those of us who are absolutely privileged, there are not many, you know, um, lucky people in the world who have the privileges that we have, but um, it, uh, it comes with the responsibility to share aspects of that privilege and probably do something that is outside of us and outside of our own, you know, like our personal lives and benefits and so on. And for me, um, I, I guess like it's combined, like the um, activism that I believe in, but also I see myself as an artist that uses artistic platforms to raise awareness because I think that the age that we're living in is the age of images and there's nothing more powerful than that. And by power, I mean like in its uh, um, positive, constructive Foucauldian sense, not its oppressive um, sense. So there's, a, I believe that a lot of the injustice has been justified through images mm -hmm. and the images, if they have the power to perpetuate certain kind of injustices and um, convince people of of that so they definitely have the power to undo that as well so i'm really interested in what the images can undo and just to remind everybody that you did perhaps play an active role though in helping beirut your, your, your primary person in venice to seek asylum in new zealand so perhaps just remind everybody about that because i'm sure that people may not be aware of it the role you played yeah, I think it's also like what, what you were saying, I guess, like sometimes uh, there's also a very, when you work with these themes and you place them in the art, art context and the art world, um, there's been so many moments that I've felt really uncomfortable with, uh, with how they perceived or like located, but then uh, there's not much control over that, but it's also important to um, mentioned that the relationships that are built over years with different people that I worked with that I see as a collaborator are relationships that continue and it's really important for me to maintain that because uh, they become part of your history and you become part of their history. With Behrouz we are still in contact at least once a week we talk and like for him to get out of there uh, was it took two, three of us to do secret meetings for nearly two years to plan an escape trip for him to New Zealand. And um, like the Australian government didn't know that he's going to New Zealand and we secretly managed to put so many people in, into work to do that. And the day that he arrived, I was in New Zealand showing Remain at Gus Fisher Gallery. And we, I had a talk and I took him to the talk as a surprise and everyone couldn't believe that Behrouz Guchani was in the gallery. It was a really beautiful and overwhelming experience. Great, thank you. Um, now, of course, most of the projects you've talked about, except for the book, um, were, were are to do with Australia and Australian uh, issues to do with injustice at very many different levels. I'm hoping you will continue your practice in that direction. But one of the reasons why I asked you to talk about your work in Tehran from 2006 is because you've gone back now to, to deal with another subject from that area. Can you really explain to us why, at this, why it felt right to go back to Iran at this particular juncture and start exploring the edges of your own culture? But also, I know that some of these issues that you deal with in the book uh, to do with your interest in uh, the power of the document document and colonial image making etc and it all relates to the area around the islands of Hormuz where you focused your project. 
Yeah, I have a very different relationship to photography in Iran. I noticed that uh, quite recently to image making here. Uh, over there, it's more of an intuitive one. I first take pictures and then I think about the meanings of them. But in Australia, I make pictures. I think about <clears throat> an idea or a concern and then I go and construct the image in some yes. ways. <clears throat> Sorry. So you, you exactly, you feel as though you're much more a visible present than intruder. You? Yeah, oh. um, exactly. And then also like with the project in south of Iran, it was just basically at the beginning, um, just taking pictures as you do as a photographer when you get excited about seeing a landscape or a place when I was traveling around there and I became fascinated by it. It was like you're taken by the beauty of the place, but then it's a strangeness because the only way that I can describe it, it's otherworldly like the mountains mm. and like <clears throat> sorry when I heard about the history of the place and you know it related to so many of different ideas that I'm interested in and explore mm. in my different works so um, immediately I thought okay this is something that I want to dig into deeper and also because my practice is constantly trying to search different areas that photography has historically contributed falsely to like when it comes to ethnography so it's something that I've been interested in a lot and then how to make work about this topic but also mm -hmm. unlearn everything that I um, I know about that kind of image making in the in the process again like there's a lot of performance and intervention in the work I collaborated with the shamans um, mm -hmm. on, on the island there's another film element to it that I'm editing at the moment it's a three channel video installation mm -hmm. that basically it's the camera that is possessed and taken to the shamans and the shamans are doing the exorcism you know like the ritual around the camera for the camera and um, again I brought those different kind of elements into the work and also in the book um, you see the drawings made by the locals yeah. of the of the possessing wind and like it was the idea of how to make work about invisible entities like the wind um, the history the history of cruelty and slavery in this context that has been largely unspoken to a point that a lot of Iranians don't even know we have people of African descent in Iran and uh, but there's a really big population of them still living in Iran and also yeah it became a really interesting you know, challenge both in terms of its content and um, its methodology, how to image the invisible. Mm. And, Have there um, been any archive that you drew on? Because I know that you're interested in colonial archives, that you've spoken about the French Algerian archives um, that, yeah. were, that are very famous of uh, how they constructed images using street women and photographed them in the nude. Were there any archives that you drew on? Had that, had that area ever been photographed before? That's the other thing that like I tried to base the book on. I looked for archives. There are archives of um, um, uh, African slaves in the Qajar, um, you know, um, uh, dynasty. And also the, there's a lot of them in different, you know, um, castles of the kings and so on, but there's not much of the Africans of the islands. Mm -hmm. And the history there is based on, you know, uh, like oral histories, like you hear so many contradictory stories from people. And I wanted to base the book on that based on incomplete knowledge and the knowledge that is multi-directional and um, disorienting. That's why the book doesn't have a beginning and end and it's it's more like a loop even the images on the cover are not in the book so they're part of the book would you or mind just the... sharing your screen with us and showing us the layout of the book because it's so beautifully put together and just talk a little bit about uh, the rhythm of it because you do start and end that's why i asked you to show that image uh, of the same image one in black and white and one in color so it's like a cycle but it is disoriented as, as you go through it and it's important for people to understand where those drawings appear because you have to really try and search for them so it's a also a performative exercise for the person reading the book. There we go. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much. And yes, like uh, uh, this is the video that MacBooks got on their website of the book. So the beginning is like, yeah, mostly like thinking about how 
reality exists in fragments and because the work was made over five years of returning the idea of time and duration as a very subjective matter and yes like the black and white landscapes are the sites where the possessing wind lives for example and the strange mountain are believed by the locals to be carved by the possessing wind so i changed the color of the sites of the of wind to black and white to be able to um uh, and also place the drawings that are made by the local of the possessing wind in between the two, like I used French fold um, to be able to kind of um, hide them in there, something that is like, um, um, you have to spend time with the book to open it. And also there are fragments of texts in there in each French fold mm -hmm. that is um, talking, like uh, taken from the interviews I did with the patients, the afflicted people that they talk about how the, the, the physical experience of being possessed by the wind. So uh, yeah, it's got multiple chapters, the book that you see also the relationship between people and the landscape mm -hmm. in the beginning and end the sections, the faces are all covered in different ways. So uh, people are refusing, it's like the idea of who's looking and the gaze and so on. So I'm trying to- uh, Reclaim the gaze. For, for yes. Them. yes. Um, can you also just talk about the wonderful essay that appears at the end? It's a short essay by Michael Tausig and, and who he is and how he contributed something quite quite special, I think, to the whole whole project. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Michael Tausig was some uh, is a Australian ethnographer who's basically um, teaching at Columbia University. He published so many books on. Um, um, you know, colonization and the history of a spirit possession and um, especially in South America. And then um, he's written so many different texts that challenges the idea of ethnography in the way that today we challenge the history of photography. He's trying to do that with ethnography. And I was always really interested in his writing, how he combines fact, fiction, personal, magic, and, um, you know, all of those things um, uh, together to, mm -hmm. uh, like, in an ethnographic context to challenge the idea of truth in history mm -hmm. and the narration and so on. So I was really interested in his writing in that sense. And then also he's got a book that is called I Swear I Saw This. And it's a collection of the drawings he made throughout his travels in places that he encountered magic and something that he couldn't express in words and he decided to translate it into a drawing and he talks about the difference between an image and a drawing and he's very critical of photography and um, also, so he wrote a book based on the field notes and the drawings that he gathered over there. And the title is that I swear I saw this. So I found a very strong connection between what I'm trying to do with the drawings there and the idea of magic and so on. So he was the best um, option. So um, I believe you had some time, you had, you had seven months whilst you were locked down in, in London to try to persuade him to do the text for you. I chased him, yeah, I actually had to chase him and send him uh, multiple emails to finally get a response. But once it, we started talking and uh, he asked me to send him the images of the book, he was very interested in the topic. And he was like, this is very related to my interest. So we spent lots of time talking about the project and I'm very happy that he contributed there, so. Yeah, and do you think there will be a, um, a moving image element of the project at some stage, you do? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm working on the, mm -hmm. on the film element, which is a three channel video installation. And it's quite immersive, very musical. You see, you hear the drums, it's made. Um, exactly, it's because good. you talk so much about the drums and the sounds and the birds and everything that they do, the rituals too. And he even talks about the absence of that when you look at the photos. So I thought you might, it might prompt you to think about doing that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There are things that you can't do with photography. And that's what Michael Tausig also talks about in the text that um, the magic of that experience is not captured. So again, the moving image felt necessary like the other two projects mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, here it's like the camera is possessed or by the camera that is possessed. I'm like talking about, you know, like again, trying to reverse the dynamic and the shamans are doing the ritual for the camera that is hidden under a fabric. Mm -hmm. So the drummers are playing and the, yeah, uh, it's like, again, like you see some of the landscapes that you see in the, um, in the book, in the film as well, but 
Yeah, it's a very performative. But the landscape is so remarkable. I remember when you first showed me the images, I asked you whether that was real, that they, they, there were these red rivers and all these, these sparkling, incredible um, minerals on the ground. But apparently it is all, it's a mineral yeah. paradise, isn't it? Is that right? It is. I think it's, um, yeah, it's like some, it, the, the, the landscape is, um, yeah, it feels like you're in Pixar animation. Like I've never seen anything <laughs> like that before. Like yeah. there are areas in one of the islands that there are like 70 different colors of the soil and they call it the rainbow valley. And um, yeah, the, the red is very red or like you actually like walk on a black sand with glittery sand, on, like dark black, and then you scratch the surface, red water comes out. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's very unique, the landscape of the place. For it's sure. very magic realism, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, do you mind people calling your project or referring to it in those terms, Huda? Yeah, um, no, not really, because I think there's a different, um, uh, magic realism is often misunderstood or misused by people mm -hmm. who want to talk about the post-colonial subject, but mm -hmm. it's because um, they actually continue associating it with its naivety, mm -hmm. which is not what I tried to do, quite the reverse. I used magic realism to talk about magic as the real because magic is real there mm -hmm. and also to add more complexity to that story rather than naivety. Mm -hmm. Uh, Huda, we're very conscious that we haven't got very much time and there are some questions related to this project and the other projects so I might just take the chance to um, an answer them now but I would say that I'm really looking forward to seeing the next stage of this because just to link back to your uh, you know the cloth ceiling project where you developed such a close relationship with that family obviously you've developed those relationships with the people of the on the street so it's going to make the next stage of the project the film I hope um, something that will just run smoothly. I mean, you've been there many, many times now, have you? Yes, yes. Oh, so, so the relationship, it, relationships are very deep. It's very deep. It's like your family. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, well, that's, very... that relates. Can I ask, um, somebody has asked that. Would you, um, Verena has asked, <laughs> would you consider the area of the Strait of Hormuz as your cultural area now? I mean, is that the place that you relate to? No, one of the things that I loved about it, which I later on realized that, for example, I think I have this fascination with islands. Islands are these in-between places that they see themselves as completely uh, detached from the countries that they claim to have them. They call themselves by the name of their islands. They're part of Iran, but they call me an Iranian. Um, I'm the Iranian. So why are you the outsider? I am the outsider, but also I think I kind of relate to those spaces because of my own experience as a migrant. After years of living here, um, you know, at some point you never fully belong to neither the place that you relocated yeah. or the place that you left behind. So you become your experience or identity is something that is sits in between the two. Mm -hmm. So islands to me represent the same kind of feeling. And I really like that in my home country, I was considered as a stranger. Mm. And of course, the, the Remain work was about an island too, so I can see the link there. Um, but this, this um, other uh, comment by Peter uh, is really about the other earlier work we talked about. As an Australian, I'm horrified by my government's treatment of asylum speaker seekers and Agonistes sh has shown how ordinary people are also silenced. Have you ever felt pressure to tone down what you're saying with your work? No, I'm actually waiting for it. Ah, well, don't <laughs> wait, wait, don't wish too, too, too much. I no, mean, I, it, I, you, I, you know, Australian censorship laws are quite tough. I know. Mm -hmm. When I was trapped in London last year and couldn't return, at some point I was getting paranoid that maybe they're trying to punish me. Oh! But, um, <laughs> but, and I was worried about coming back to Australia because the work was launched in Melbourne when I was in London. But uh, I am curious about, you know, how far you can go within a democratic system and how far you can mm -hmm. press the buttons and at what, what point they would stop you. And that's the beauty of democracy, something that I'm trying to celebrate or also practice my right as a democratic citizen, you know, the right to dissent. And um, we don't probably have democracy anymore, but we have patterns of democracy and including, you know, freedom of speech to a certain degree that is being taken away. So you want to practice that, but I don't know where it ends. I'm waiting to see. So will the next project be the one that does that? 
<laughs> let's hope not but uh, of course everybody would want to know as i would um is you are you able to to present your work in, in iran at this at this moment or not is that a plan for the future are you able to what are talking uh, about censorship what what would be the situation there? Work, i am very curious to see if i can show it a lot of my work for example even remain because it deals with, like a lot of the people in it are kurdish and yeah. um talking about the Kurdish refugees and like they, they speak about the experience yeah. in Iran or the other work that I made in a secret bathhouse with the homosexuals it, in Iran. None of those works can be exhibited. I had, uh, I, like there's been galleries approaching me telling me that they wish they could show it. But um, at this stage, I prefer not to be noticed much in Iran by showing. Hopefully one day there will be freedom and what about the, the Straits of Hormuz work yeah I'm very curious to see if I, I was planning to go back last year to exhibit you know the film like set up a video projection and exhibit it there with them and celebrate it but I haven't been able to because of COVID yeah um, I, I will definitely seek opportunities to show that work there and I'm sure there'll be a huge amount of interest there because the Tehran, especially uh, artistic um, circuit, is incredibly vibrant, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um, culturally very diverse, yeah. Mm, and very rich. Um, I think that's that's nearly bringing us to the end of the, our talk because I'm very conscious of time. Are there any more, Louis, we just need Louisa to make sure there are no more questions that I've missed seeing. I mean, lots of people, of course, but in the, in the chat, if you look later, have just said how powerful it, uh, the work has been. Some of them have seen it in various places. And somebody said, um, I saw it in photo 2021, I was weeping a little. Well, that's, you know, often how I felt really watching Remain and many of your other pieces of work. And that's so fascinating to hear about the agonistas, which I hadn't heard about, and to see them in person at the in Bath recently. I'd love to see the film um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a gallery setting. I hope I will, but I think I, I think, think I have I have um, I have uh, covered all the uh, questions now. So we might just pass back to Louisa Ulliet to say some closing remarks and and to thank I just, on behalf of everybody at the gallery, Buddha and, and myself who admires your work so much. Thank you so much for the time today and for giving us the opportunity to to, to talk about all of your work, especially the new book. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brett. That means the world to me. Thanks, yeah, everybody. Um... I think you did catch all the questions, Brett, but um, yeah, just to echo Brett's sentiments, so to thank you for being with us today. Um, it was really such a joy and we appreciate you staying up a little bit later. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, thank you also to Brett Rogers and to our colleagues, uh, John Buckle and Natasha Polwright for the support and to you all here for your ongoing commitment to the gallery. Uh, we continue to be grateful to be welcomed into your homes and to have the opportunity to share the important work of Hoda Afshar. We will make this recording available um, on our YouTube channel and our, on our event page, so just keep an eye out for that. Anyway, I hope you're all okay and that we see you at some of our other forthcoming events and even more hopefully at the gallery. Uh, thank you all again and have a great day. Thanks thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, so much Huda. I just Thanks. wanted to say I would love to meet Verena someday because um, I know that she is, she, is she the lady you might work with in Vienna? Uh, yes, um, 